Thank you. Good morning, good morning. Thank you for coming. Thank you for those watching uh, on the webcast. I'm Dan Thomas. I'm the Communications Director and Spokesperson for the President of the 70th Session of the UN General Assembly, His Excellency Moans Lukatoft. We've heard some very strong statements this morning uh, in the General Assembly, just behind where we're standing, uh, from the President, the Secretary General, and the Member States on the need to learn from the recent and very serious allegations against the President of the 68th Session. Without further ado, let me ask Mr. Lukatoft to brief you on the steps he is already taking to strengthen the institution and integrity of the office. Mr. President. Thank you, Dan. Uh, you may have listened already to the discussion in the General Assembly, but in an effort to enhance the role, authority, transparency, and effectiveness of the UN General Assembly and the Office of the President of the General Assembly, I have asked Member States today to continue their work on revitalization of the General Assembly during this ongoing 70th session. With this in mind, I recently reappointed uh, the ambassadors of Croatia and Namibia to continue the work as co-chairs of the uh, mandated ad hoc working group on the revitalization. During the uh, past session, the working group focused on four thematic clusters and identified ways to enhance uh, the assembly's uh, uh, capabilities, which I detailed uh, uh, in my remarks this morning. Uh, I would, however, take this opportunity with you uh, to draw uh, attention to the fourth cl cluster which relates to the running of the Office of the President of the General Assembly, a matter which has taken uh, 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 on even greater significance uh, with the recent events relating to the President of this 68th session. As I told those of you who were present at my press conference on October 6th, the same day that the news of those events broke, I was and remain deeply shocked by the accusations. The United Nations and its representatives should be held to the highest standards of transparency and ethics. When I took office as president uh, on the 15th of September, I committed to uphold these principles during my tenure, and I am firmly committed to do so. The office of the President is subject to serious checks and balances, including the terms of briefings to Member States, audit on regular budget, and the, uh, uh, the office uh, PGA Trust Fund, and reporting through the, uh, the GI revitalization process, etc., etc. Like any institution, however, there is always scope for improvement, which is why I have asked the GA, uh, through this discussion on revitalization this session, to give further consideration to the strengthening, uh, the independence, and the integrity of this office. Transparency, however, is also a matter for each and every president, and from the outset I have taken a number of steps to support the objective. In addition to that, today, on a new transparency page on my website, I am making available an information note on the office of the PGA that builds on the, the PGA handbook, uh, and I wish also to set out three principles of the conduct that I and my office will adhere to during the presidency. First, integrity and impartiality, representing the assembly in an impartial matter, avoiding conflicts of interest, ensuring gender and geographical balance in my office. And second, transparency and accountability, providing information about official travel, finances, engagement, communicating openly with the membership and external audiences and complying with all relevant rules and procedures. 
And third, professionalism and effectiveness, running my office eff effectively and using the resources efficiently, keeping appropriate records and ensuring a smooth transition to our successors. Uh, I uh, know there is a great interest of all this also in the, in the membership. I met, for instance, this morning with a number of, bas of ambassadors who su uh, supported very much the initiatives already taken and got, get, got had inspiration for the further process, and I welcome that very much. Over the coming month, I'll be listening uh, further on intently to the views of member states on how best to further revitalize the process of the work of the Assembly. Let me just add, uh, if you go into the website and look at the document we, we put on this morning, uh, you can see uh, reflections on the background. You can see how it has evolved with the mandates for the uh, PGA over time. Uh, it's much more workload now than it was originally because of, of several resolutions and other mandates being given to the PGA over time. And uh, we have uh, a, a statement on, on the rules and regulations about the regular budget and the trust fund to support the office of the PGA uh, and a number of other details, which I, of course, would uh, answer any questions about as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and thank you for taking the lead on uh, more transparency, which is highly welcome. Uh, my, my question, or perhaps a remark, uh, the allegations against the PGA of the 68th session did not involve any uh, uh, foul play uh, within the office of the PGA uh, finances or budgets, but it was more uh, an abuse of status of the PGA uh, into personal gains. How can this be controlled uh, in the future uh, to, to, to define well the, what exactly the PGA is doing and what is accepted ethically and otherwise mandated by uh, the, the various uh, regulations of, of the office? I see the point of your question. And of course, it's, uh, and I, I often met the same problem back in my home country in Parliament, when we have a breach in regulations, should we make new regulations because of that, or should we improve the enforcement of the regulations we have? And that's, of course, a balance. But I think that when we uh, determine ourselves, and I think that's not only for the PGA office, but for the United Nations in general, to be much more transparent also in uh, which contacts we have, have during our uh, tenure as serving the United Nations. It will be much more easy for you, the gentlemen and ladies of the press, to identify any efforts towards misconduct of the office. Question over here. Thanks a lot. Um, and thanks for doing the stakeout. I, I see in your information note uh, under official travel, it says that other funding sources can be used, including host organization. And since some of the allegations are that, for example, as recently as August 2015, Mr. Eng Lap Seng and his son Kian Ip Foundation, he's since been indicted, paid for travel of UN staff, ambassadors, and others to Macau. How, how is this going to close that loophole in which a, a, business, in, in, you know, a business executive can offer luxury hotels, first-class tickets to faraway places? And I also wanted to ask you both the, 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 I'm going to say this, I guess, diplomatically. The, the presidents of the 68th and 69th session, both of their spouses, took compensated positions with non NGOs that have since been, the, the heads of which have been indicted, Global Sustainability Foundation and South-South News. I mean, the heads of each. So how, how do you, would, would you address that? And finally, would you consider implementing some sort of a freedom of information policy in your office, i.e., rather than just putting things on your website, if the press or public make a request for a document, unless there's some reason to withhold it, to make it available in a certain period of time? Thanks a lot. Sorry for the long question. I think uh, I'm not able to go much further into the, accusa uh, the accusations raised. Uh, that, that's for, not for me to to comment on, and I can say that we have 
no access, and that's maybe also a procedure that should be changed in the future, but we have no access whatsoever to documents from earlier uh, PGA offices. So I can't give you any details about what was uh, present there. And, and, and in that connection, I think it's, uh, it's of interest what the Secretary General just said about the investigation he has uh, put into force about uh, uh, what, what is of information in connection with the case in other parts of the UN organization. But we have no access to any of this now if you look backwards. If you look forwards, of course, uh, I would be uh, willing to provide any kind of, of access to information about traveling I do during my t tenure uh, as president. Much of what we have committed ourselves to do has to be generalized during the considerations in the General Assembly over the revitalization, uh, probably in, in, in the, the shape, in the form of a resolution. But what I can tell you here is what we will do, how we will proceed with the openness of information during this coming year. Uh, thank you very much. If I understand correctly, you are not uh, ruling out at all accepting private contributions or charity contributions for your office or for your personal travel. But do you think that there needs to be additional vetting of where these private contributions are coming from? If so, who should do that vetting? And is there a role for the Secretariat to play? Well, I think that the easiest uh, way is to, to communicate uh, what kind of funds we get for traveling from outside sources. Uh, in my case, it has only been about uh, a couple of member countries inviting me and taking upon them the travel expenses to, to the visit to them. But, but uh, I mean, the openness could easily be that every time there is a travel financed by somebody else, it will be uh, exposed on our website. And I think we have no problems with that. Mr. President, I'm confused as to why you wouldn't have access to any records from previous presidents of the General Assembly, especially given that some of them had some rather, I, I would say, opaque and mercurial travel arrangements organized, including Mr. Descoto, uh, would often be doing uh, a lot of activism, political activism, in some of his travels, and presumably he was invited by the ALBA group or whatever was happening. But I don't understand why the sort of the buck stops with you, and it's great that all these reforms will be implemented, but isn't part of the vetting and learning process actually digging into perhaps some of the dirt of, of previous presidents? And also, can you bring us up to speed as to where things are in terms of your office's cooperation with prosecutors? Yes, of course, we will try to answer any question we may get from the prosecutors. But as I told you, we have no information sheets about the past. There may be information other uh, uh, places in the organization because much of it, uh, what has been taken place has, uh, according to the rules, uh, had to be checked in, in the organization. And that's why I must refer the question you have about the past to the investigation now started by the Secretary General. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is about the empowerment of the General Assembly, if you may allow me to ask this question. On November 3, 1950, the, United, the General Assembly adopted a resolution, number 377, about empowering the General Assembly. It's called United for Peace Resolution. I'm sure you are aware of it. Do you envision during your presidency that this resolution could be reactivated, where the General Assembly can take the role, executive role of the Security Council 
in case the Security Council failed to address a case of peace and security, just like the Arab-Israeli conflict. The Security Council is being prevented from adopting a new resolution on the Arab-Israeli conflict. Can the General Assembly adopt that role or take it based on that resolution? Thank you. Well, that's a very far-reaching question. Uh, I, I think you, you always have to study both the history and the charter in order to, to determine what task can the General Assembly take upon itself. Uh, so I, I will not go further into answering that question, but I think that there are obviously in the Charter a number of possibilities for the General Assembly to act, which hasn't been used that often and, and, and could be used in the future. That's what I can say about it now. But what we have been concerned out about in connection with the present case, the, the, uh, about the, the uh, uh, accusations in the par of, of activities in the past is that there is a more general problem of the resources for the office of the PGA, how they are provided. Uh, the situation now is right with this president, that we have a uh, secondant from, from my homeland, from Denmark, we have a small amount of money from, from the ordinary budget of the United Nations, uh, from the Secretariat. And then we have a number, I think it's 14 individual secondees from member states. And that adds up to the, the Secretariat we have now. What you can say is one of the problems that could uh, lead to a too strong role for uh, shadowy financing of the PGA is that very small mem and poor member states who uh, are, elect uh, who are, is, uh, are elected for the presidency would have difficulties in establishing a sufficient cabinet to support the president because of lack of resources. And that's a question I think has to be addressed, not this year, but for the future and I think what the Secretary General just said in the debate was also around this, this question of financing the necessary resources for the increased uh, number of, uh, of uh, demands for services from the President of the General Assembly. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I want to uh, follow up on a, qu a question earlier about vetting. I know you had indicated that you intend to be fully transparent uh, and disclose the sources of uh, monies for travel, et cetera, in your office. Uh, but I, are you intending to put into place more rigorous uh, risk assessment uh, analyses for vetting sources, particularly of private donations? There are parts of the UN uh, that do have a pretty elaborate process for uh, examining uh, collaborative relationships, uh, private relationships with uh, the UN agency and looking at a risk profile. Is there, is there a mechanism that you intend to put in place or reach out to get help from the Secretariat? Thank you. Well, I understand the question is for the whole broader uh, discussion of private contributions to, to organizations inside the UN. Uh, and, and I'm certainly uh, able, uh, willing to engage in a discussion about how to deal with that. I think the, the, the obvious first step is total transparency about who is contributing. And that's what we are, are, are trying to make for sure at the office of the PGA, and that could very well be a standard we should try to apply for each and every part of the UN organization. Clara um, with uh, a question. Hi, <clears throat> thank you. Has your office or has any UN office actually had communications with prosecutors about this case? And if so, what kind of communications and what kind of cooperation is going on? Thank you. I cannot answer for all UN offices. I can say we have had no communication up till now have been no questions asked to us, and maybe it's because they know already 
that we have very few uh, possibilities to answer any questions. But I'm sure uh, uh, we will try to facilitate so the, so the, uh, the right persons and institutions any question we may get from the office of the prosecutor. Thank you, Mr. President, for the handout of, and uh, for the information. You mentioned the first step is transparency. What do you think should be the second step? Uh, do, uh, for example, do you think there should be a preventive measure, such as more regulator, regulations on the office of PGA by another body of the UN, such as a secretariat? Do you think that should be a right move, or, um, or the there will not be more regulations? What is your view about this as a solution, or as a preventive for uh, future misconduct? Um, in the office of PGA. Thank you. Well, I think uh, what we should make sure about uh, also the office of the PGA is that all funding go through the channels that's actually already under the scrutiny uh, of the, the controllers of the UN. That, that's very simple. We are the, 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 uh, the trust fund and the, the ordinary budget we get from the UN uh, is under that control and, and uh, there should be no private contributions, outside contributions uh, going in along other roads than that. That's the way to do it. Um, on a slightly unrelated issue, the selection of the next Secretary General, do you anticipate issuing a joint letter with the President of the Security Council anytime soon? Uh, and if not, uh, what reaction have you heard from members of the Security Council about the prospects of a joint letter? Well, we are ready from the site of my office to write this letter with the the President of the Security Council. Uh, we are ready this month if the Security Council is ready as well. I'm, I'm not fully informed about that, but I think we have within the next couple of months at least to have that letter written and the process started. And I would like it to be as quickly as possible. We are ready. We have, we have written a draft that is under consideration now uh, at the Security Council. Have you shared that with members of the Security Council the draft? Uh, I've shared it with the President of the Security Council, and I, I assume he will share it with, with the members of the Security Council. Uh, Mr. President, you obviously at one point aspired to become President of the General Assembly. Why? Why, I, what, why did you want to become a... What's the incentive? Why aspire to become a, a President of the General Assembly? <laughs> you want a very long story or a short answer? <laughs> the, the, well, the, the, uh, it just came to me from the Foreign Office in Denmark three years ago that Denmark had the possibility of getting this position this year. And they came whispering, answering, would you be, uh, accept to be named as a person that could take over this. And I thought about it a couple of months, three months or something, tried to investigate what was in it uh, and if it was something I could do. And they said to me, very flattering of course, that with your background as former foreign minister and present speaker, we think uh, we can come out without any opposition from the, the Western and others group. And that was actually happened. And, uh, and, and the other part of the answer is, well, since I was a very young man, uh, since I was a boy, I've been very engaged in international affairs. And uh, this is a unique uh, opportunity to try to do something about peace and development and human rights, uh, which I never thought about was a possibility for me. And I know that with the rules and regulations and uh, 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 the... Uh, uh, going around among the membership, uh, the next chance for Denmark will probably be in 150 years from now. Thank you very much. Mr. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.